أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بفضل الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق الله أجمعين محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين واللعنته الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقضى ربك ألا تعبدوا إلا إياه وبالوالدين إحسانا إما يبلغن عندك الكبر أحدهما أو كلاهما فلا تكن لهما أف ولا تنهرهما وكلهما قولا كريما صدق الله العلي العظيم that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained the respect and the love of the parents. He equates it to worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and accepting His oneness. That for you not to take a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is equated with you being good to your parents and treating your parents well. That it is something that is logical and something that is easily understood with the plain mind that if somebody bestows a favor upon you if somebody does a good by you that what is the reward of goodness other than goodness if someone does something good to you then you owe them something good even if they don't say and tell you you owe them something but you do but if someone is responsible for everything someone is responsible for your creation, for you being brought into this world, for you having life, for supporting you in every aspect of your life, then surely you owe them more than you owe anybody else. On this auspicious occasion, we commemorate the birth of Imam Hassan al-Mushtaba This holy Imam, the second holy Imam, who was named al-Hassan by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this word literally means the good. And thus the title of the Imam, Abu al-Hasan, the father of Imam Ali alayhi salam, the father of Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam, has received this title through obviously him being the father of good and being the father of Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam. He is known as Karim Ahlul Bayt, the generous of the Ahlul Bayt. Because he used to give so much and was so generous that in fact in his lifetime, he parted with his wealth on three times, three occasions completely in uh, some traditions and in some that he gave a complete half of his wealth every single thing that he had he gave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he started again and he gave it to the poor to charity he was somebody that would never leave anyone that was needy without having or being able to uh, be away from their need to be able to have wealth or be able to eat or be able to live and so the Imam sallallahu alayhi there are so many lessons that we can learn from his life and specifically the core lesson that we'd like to speak about tonight and remind one another of is this lesson of the duty that we owe to our parents. There are certain things and certain man mannerisms that you have to maintain and you have to learn. Do you know in the old Arab days uh, before the Holy Prophet announced his mission of prophethood that they used to gather together, the Arabic tribes would sit with one another and the men would sit alone and they wouldn't allow any child to sit with them. No child was allowed to join the gathering until he understood the rules of men because there was no rule, there was no room for error. So there was no action that would show disrespect. Imagine they were tribal at the time and in that, that tribal mannerism they taught one another these systems of respect. Of them we take for granted in this day and age. I'll give you an example because of the culture that we've grown up in. One example is you can go to the shop and buy thongs. And obviously by thongs I mean shoes. And you can buy these thongs that you put them on your, you put them on your feet and you can find some with an Australian flag on them. And this is meant to be patriotic. Wear them on Australia Day. However, if we look at our culture, if you go to Lebanon or Syria or any of the Arab lands or Iran and try and find a thong with the flag on it or a shoe with the flag on it and if you do this is the utmost disrespect it would be absolutely rude to wear that on there, it wouldn't show patriotism, it would show that you hate this country or you, you, you're against the country that you're in so there's, a, there's a, a huge disparity between what they see as respectful and what is seen as respectful in Islamic terms so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the Imams He lays down the law 
He lays down the law about how you're supposed to treat your parents. Of the things that you should never do is call your parents by their first name. This is something that's a huge no-no. People take it or they hear it from their children when they're young and it's funny and it's cute, but it's not something that they should get used to. They should always call you by your title, which is father or mother. That your title isn't your first name. You shouldn't. And these things obviously are makruh, and this is from Birr al This is from being good to your parents. If you want to be good to your parents and not be bad, you shouldn't sit opposite your father or your mother. You should always sit by their side or next to them. Because opposite them, it's like you're making yourself an equal. That you should kiss their hand when you meet them. If you take something from your, their hand, your hand should be beneath always and never above. If you shake their hand, your hand should always be beneath and never above. You should never raise uh, your voice at your parents. You should never raise your hand at your parents. In fact, there's a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, min, min, min aquq al-waldin is had al nadar That if you look at them, if you look at them and you focus your vision on them, this is from aquq al If you look at them and focus your... So it's not even a bad look, but you're just focusing in their face. This is something that's very important. Now these things culturally, sometimes they might be lost, specifically with second generation and third generations of living in a, th- in, a, in, in a Western world country. But these are very important for us to understand and to take on board into our lives in the way that we treat our parents. To show you how, uh, how well rewarded it is in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being good with your parents. In this verse in the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says that you have to be good to your parents specifically in their old age. وَإِذْ بَلَغَ الْكِبَرَ أَحَدُهُمَا أَوْ كِلَاهُمَا If they become old, or both of them, or one of them. That you have to show your goodness to them specifically in old age. The reason being that in their young age, when they have the strength and the ability, if you look at them funny, you'll know about it. You'll feel a burning sensation on the side of your face. But when they become older, they don't have that ability anymore. This is the time when you're supposed to be good to them. This is the time where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, and lower your wing of mercy towards them. That you should sit with them as if they know and you don't know. Even if you know something better than they do. Act as if you're learning from them. You should sit with them and be respectful to them in the utmost manner. The best respect, in fact, the Imam Zayn al-Abidin alayhi salam in Sahifat al-Sajjadiyya, he speaks about, in a dua, he asks Allah, Oh Allah, give me the fee before my parents, like the fee that I have before a tyrant. You know when you stand before a tyrant or someone that's a valim, and you have this fear and you're careful with what you say. Because the tyrant will use any word that you say against you. This is a similar concept when you speak to the police. Anybody that speaks to the police for whatever purpose, the job of the police is to make a conviction. If they don't make a conviction, they're not doing their job. And this is why you're always told, don't speak to the police at all. Absolutely. Because whatever you say, even if you're excusing yourself, they only take the part that can validate their conviction. And therefore you're careful with the way that you speak, or you have to be careful with the way that you speak. And this is something that's normal in these countries. In fact, they, they tell you this, Sallallahu Alaihi Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Sallallahu Alaihi Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. الثاني على حب الإمام الحسن المشتبه اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد And so He asks Allah that oh Allah give me that fear as if I'm standing before a tyrant Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam on many occasions Imam Ali alayhi salam would tell him to get up and to speak in front of the people and if the Imam was there, if Imam Ali alayhi salam was there, alayhi salam, Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam would say, I can't speak if you were here, Father. If you were in, in uh, the same masjid or the same area, how can I speak? Not only are you the Imam of my time, but you are my father. And so one time, Amir al-Mu'mineen was ill. And there's many stories of this, but he was ill, so he sent Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam to lead the jama'ah. Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam led the prayers. He prayed. When he finished, he got up to speak. And as he was speaking, the people heard. But they heard the words and the voice of Rasulullah. And so they ran to hear. And they flocked towards the masjid to listen to these words that were the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then all of a sudden Imam al-Hasan alayhi sallam stops speaking. And he says to them, Kalla lisan. My tongue is no longer, has, no longer has the ability 
to articulate. وَعَصُرَ بَيَانِ He says, and my articulation has become difficult. كَأَنَّ عَلِيًّا يَرَانِ As if Ali, Imam Ali alayhi salam or my father sees me. And it's, it was true, the Imam was standing around and he could see him. So even if he felt the presence of his father, he didn't feel that he could speak before his father. There's a beautiful tradition that shows you how great of a duty that we owe the parents and how great the reward is of being to the parents. The reward is huge. And on the contrary, if you are bad to your parents, nothing is accepted. No deed of yours is accepted. There is so many ahadith of them. If you look at your parents, a dirty look, your salah is not accepted. You give them a dirty look, your salah is not accepted until you go and you seek their forgiveness from them. Just that. Not shouting at them, not disobeying them, just giving them a dirty look. That's enough. Your prayers are unaccepted. There's a hadith that, that says, it's a hadith Qudsi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that even if you do the actions of the Anbiya, you follow the sunan of the Anbiya, and you are bad to your parents, none of it is accepted. You will not see the paradise. Paradise is beneath the mother's feet. As the, the famous hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that the place of paradise lays or lies with the blessing or the pleasure of your mother. And so it is so important for us to do this. In fact, some people, they feel like they can pay back what their parents have done or the things that their parents have done for them. And so a man, one day he wanted to pay back the good that his mother had done. So he carried her on his back and he took her to the Hajj for X amount of years. And for everything that she needed, he was there. He took her with him everywhere. And so he asks the Holy Prophet, there's diff differing traditions, some with the Holy Prophet, some with the Imams, that have I given the right of my mother through this? And so the Prophet tells him that you have done all of these good things. However, your intent while you're doing these things is my parents or my mother is getting old. She will die sometime. So let me do the good things that I can to her before she leaves this world. He says, whereas your parents, when they raise you and they look after you the whole time, all they're thinking about is my son or my daughter will grow to be something great. My son or daughter will grow to be healthy. My son or daughter will grow to have a good life. And the whole time this is their intent of raising you for that. See where the intention completely differs? The feeling of the parent towards the child and the child towards the parent. And that's something that's irreplaceable. Imam Zayn al-Abidin alayhi salam in Risalat al-Hukuk, when he speaks about when, he, when he, he speaks about the rights of the mother and the rights of the father, it's very short, but it's very eloquent. And it puts everything in its place. He says about the father, your father is your root. That he is your source, he's your foundation. Were it not for him, you wouldn't exist. Your father, any good deed that you find in you. Some people get upset with their parents, they get upset with their father, they don't like the actions of their father. But any good thing that you see in you, if you're courageous, it's from your father. If you're honest, it's from your father. If you're wise, it's from your father. If you're hygienic, it's from your father. Any good deed that you have, it's from your father. And this is the right of a father, or a, 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 a concise portion of the right of your father upon you. As for the right of the mother, he says this is a far greater right than the right of the father. The mother has a far greater right, he says, because she carried you where nobody else can carry. She fed you from her internal organs. She protected you with her internal organs. This is something that no one can do for you or no one would do for you, even if they had that ability. How far would you be carried? And so he gives us this lesson to give us a logical idea or a, or a, uh, a very realistic uh, parable of what we owe to our parents. However, when we look at the deeds in Islam, the greatest of deeds, and even though we live in a climate and an environment with some of these issues, we are pressured to not speak of these things, we are pressured to speak of, not of these issues, such as the concept of jihad. And al-jihad fi sabilillah is the greatest of actions. To give your life in the way of Allah is the greatest of actions. This is the, the peak, that over every good is good in the hadith, until one gives his life in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jihad is of the greatest actions, of the greatest deeds. And even though it's referred to as Jihad al-Asghar, there's a hadith regarding Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This man comes to Rasulullah 
And he says to him, إِنِّي رَاغِبٌ فِي الْجِهَادِ نَشِيطٌ He says to him that I am wishing to go to jihad. I have this fervor. I'm inspired to go towards jihad. And so the Holy Prophet says to him, he says, الجهاد في سبيل فجاهد في سبيل الله فإنك إن تقتل تكون حيا عند الله ترزق. He says, if you are killed in the way of Allah, and as the Quran says, do not say about the ones who are killed in the way of Allah as dead, but أحياءن عند ربهم يرزقون. They are alive with their God, receiving sustenance. He says, if you are killed, and this is the best way to go. And in the du'a of Shah Ramadan, what do we ask? وَقَتْلًا فِي سَبِيلِكَ فَوَفِّقْ لَنَا On a daily basis, they give us that tawfiq because there's nothing greater and better than this. And so he says that if you, die, that if you are killed, you will stay alive with Allah and you will receive your sustenance. And then, sustenance. And then he says, وَإِن تَمُوتْ فَقَدْ وَقَعَ أَجْرُكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ And if you die, so you are not killed, but you're on the battlefield and you die for whatever purpose. For some purpose you, you, you fall ill or you die on the battlefield or you die as you're going to jihad, your reward is upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is of the highest levels of, of reward. That this reward is something that comes directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's something that's immeasurable, something that you can't count. And then he says, and if you return, when rajat, he says, if you return, it is as if you have returned and you have no sins. So you go, you battle, you come back, all your sins are gone. So this is how great the reward is. And then he says to him, to the Prophet, he says, I have two elderly parents. And these elderly parents, they enjoy it when I'm by their side. I'm going off to fight, but they enjoy it when I'm by their side. So the Holy Prophet wasallam, he says to him, then go back to your parents and remain with your parents. He says, for surely one night and one day of you keeping them company in their old age, that you're not doing anything special for them. All, it's just you being there makes them happy. You being there brings their heart to life. He says, you being there every night and every day is the reward of one year of jihad. Sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Is better than the reward of one year of jihad. And this is the ultimate reward. I don't have much time for tonight because we want to enjoy the night and I don't want to bore you. And we have the poets coming. Uh, inshallah, we can enjoy this uh, poetry about our holy Imam. However, I'll just leave you with a small story. And in general, in general, what we need to do really, and again, I repeat it again and again, and it's not b my command, but the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This concept of insaf, that you have to be fair. Be fair with yourself. Because ultimately, whatever you do, that's what you're going to meet on the Day of Judgment. Some of the ulama speak about, it's a philosophical concept that there's no fire on the Day of Judgment, yet we bring the fire in our own hands. That the fire, the punishment is what you bring with you. So the way that you treat your family, the way that a parent, the hadith of Rasulullah, that the best parents are the ones that help their children be good to them. They help their children be good to them. How? Be worthy of that, that goodness. You are worthy just as a parent. But have this good akhlaq with them that will reciprocate that good akhlaq. That good akhlaq will come back to you. But you have a smiley face to them, it'll come. Don't make it hard on them. Whether they like it or not, they have to be good to their parents. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says so. But don't make it hard on them. This is all it is. Be fair. And it goes back to all of our social issues. The way that you treat your wife, you will have a daughter that will be treated like that. This is, this is a law Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set. And it's a very precise law. No matter who you hurt or what you harm, it will come back. It doesn't come back to you, it will come back in your grandchildren. Too many stories. I could sit here all night and tell you stories of, of, of social issues where this has happened. People come and they command something of others and then when it falls back on them, it's the hardest thing, it's the biggest thing. Or they scorn and they treat someone badly that they think can't do anything back to them, but it doesn't happen in them, it happens in their children or their children's children. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the world to be like this. This is the same thing. It's a simple rule. Birru aba'akum, yabarrukum, abna'akum. Be good to your fathers, your children will be good to you. Be good to your, afan, to your parents, your children will be good to you. Be bad to your parents, guaranteed. That's what you're going to get. 
And having a difficult or a bad child is one of the hardest things. Anyway, we'll just finish off with this small story, inshallah, that will give us an idea of how great the reward is. And mind you, this is the fastest thing. You know, there's certain actions, we do different actions uh, that give us reward, but there's some actions that are immediate. You get the reward straight away. Of these actions, or the, the, the action that gives you the reward the quickest and the wrath of Allah the quickest, is Birr al If you are good to your parents, you get the quickest reward straight away. It's like when a person dies, the thing that reaches them the quickest is sadaq. You pay sadaqah, it reaches them the quickest. In the same way, if you are bad to your parents, the wrath will come quick. Quicker than you imagine. Quicker than you imagine. If you fall off your motorbike, you break your leg, you... these things happen. Your car gets totaled. And you know where it's from, but you just, this thing just happened to me. But you know exactly where it came from. And so in this story, there's three young men. They're stuck inside a cave. A boulder gets closed over them. And the three of them, they want to get out of this cave. And so they decide that what we'll do is we will pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we'll ask him by the best deed that we have done. Free us from this prison. This prison that is the cave. By the best deed that we've done. So the first one gets up. And he speaks his best deed. He says, Ya Allah. There's this deed that you know about. By this deed. One day I hired a contractor to build a fence. So the fence builder came to build the fence. They didn't agree on a price. You know the famous Lebanese, Mam That you know, that's it. And they walk in and then it, no one knows what the price was. And it continues forever. It becomes a family blood feud. So he builds the fence. And when he finishes, he, uh, the man built his fence. So this guy that's stuck in the cave, he said, when I finish building the fence, I gave him two gold coins. The man wasn't happy with the two gold coins. And so he said, then just take them at least. He says, I don't want your money. If you either give me what I want or I don't want your money. So he says, I took these two gold coins. The fence contractor left. Uh, I took these two gold coins and I bought two sheep. And these two sheep started mating and making more sheep and more sheep and more sheep. He says, and I just kept them in, the, in a back paddock. One day I saw the fence, con fence contractor again a while later. The guy that builds the fences. He says, I saw him. And I said to him, that remember the two gold coins I, I owed you? He says, oh, don't worry about it. It's a long time ago. He says, no, I bought two sheep with them. And now look, they've become a hundred sheep, for example. Take all of those sheep as your payment. So the man was happy. Like back then, this is even now, that's, he's made him rich. He's loaded. So he took the sheep and he was happy. He says, this is the good deed. Please remove this rock. And a little bit of the rock breaks off. A little bit of the, it's, it's a massive boulder that's blocking the cave. A little bit of it breaks off. So the second one stands up. He says, Oh Allah, one day when I was in the real world, before I entered this cave, I was a shopkeeper. And while I was in the sh working in the, in the shop, a lady who had orphans, she was a widow, she came and asked me for some free food. He said, and I saw she was pretty. So I said to her, I'll give you free food, but I want something in return. So she found it too hard. Her honor wouldn't allow her. So she said, I can't. And she left. He says, after she left, I felt so bad that here's this widow with orphans. How could I do this? He says, so for the, for the rest of my life, every day I would anonymously go and deliver a box of food to their house. I'd fill up, stock up on the best food for the rest of my life to pay that back. This is my good deed, Ya Allah. Please remove this boulder. And so another bit of the boulder breaks off. And then the last man stands up and he says, Allah, Allah. And you saw those deeds that they did, they, they're big. And they're costly. And they're hard. The last one, he says, Oh Allah, that one day I heard my mother coughing in the middle of the night. So I woke up and I went towards my mother and I asked her, do you need anything? She says, get me a glass of water. He says, so I went and got her a glass of water and I went and stood, went back to give it to her. She had fallen back asleep. He says, so I just sat down next to her holding the glass of water waiting for her to wake up. She didn't wake up until the Fajr. When she wake up at the, woke up at the Fajr, she said to him, uh, she, she said to him, have you been there all night? And he says, yes. She says, why? He says, I didn't want to wake you. You went back to sleep, so I'll just wait here with this water to give you. So his mother was pleased with him for that little action. 
They say the boulder flew away from the cave and it opened up and they were allowed their release. Oh, Masalli ala Muhammad. Ali Muhammad. So, the moral to the story if you want what is good in this world, you have to produce good. And the best way to produce good is goodness to your parents. And throughout the lectures that we've spoken, that we've discussed together, we have spoken about this universal concept, specifically when it comes to your parents. Because honestly, logically, if you think about it, these ones that brought you, Allah placed them as the medium to bring you into existence. If you're not good with them, then who will you be good with? If you're not good with them, then what good is within you? We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us happiness on this uh, festivous occasion, which is the, the birth of Imam Al-Hasan Al-Mushtaba Karim Ahl Al-Bayt. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the reappearance of our holy Imam, Ashul Al-Faraj Al-Sharif, to have mercy on our dead, to cure our sick, to accept our deeds in this holy month. Wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. رحم الله من كرأ سورة المباركة الفاتحة وأهدى ثوابها إلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات تصبح الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد